The death of Superman. I can't believe I found one. I'm gonna sell it for millions and retire early and put my kids through college. Yeah, okay, maybe not. Welcome to Comic Misconceptions, a show that takes you into detail about the things you think you know about comics. I'm your host, Scott Nicewander, and we're going to be doing another kind of different style episode again this week, because you guys really seem to like the last one we did about secret identities, and in light of this happening, I feel like I really want to talk about it. So in case you hadn't heard, a near mint condition copy of Action Comics number 1, a comic book that many would consider to be the most important comic book ever made, recently sold for $3.2 million. This, no doubt, has sparked some interest in the market of collecting comic books. You know, like when BuzzFeed tells you that your Game Boy Color is worth over $1,500, so you search through all of your things to find it and put it up online only to find out that it's really only worth $20? A very similar thing happened to comic books in the 90s, and the industry almost died completely because of it. So first off, full disclosure if any biases show during this video, because I never really got into the whole collecting comic books thing. I'm almost all digital for a long list of reasons that I'll probably make a video about sometime in the future, but the main one being that I find having a lot of physical copies of comic books laying around to be pretty cumbersome. My dad gave me a chunk of his collection when I graduated college and I really do want to read them all and I'm going to, but for right now they're just kind of sitting in my closet in a couple long boxes taking up valuable space. Not that I don't appreciate it, dad, if you're watching. I do. Thank you. But one argument I hear a lot from my friends who do collect comics is that digital comics, unlike their physical copies, don't have any resale value. And yeah, that's true. Most, if not all, digital comic book retailer terms of use agreements, like Marvel for instance, clearly state that you do not own the digital comic book you bought, but have rather unlocked a private viewing session to it. But that doesn't inherently mean that your physical comic book collection will be worth thousands or millions of dollars. In fact, there's a great article by Business Week that says the comic books that you have just sitting in your basement are to be blunt, probably worthless. In it, they tell stories of a few people who have collected thousands upon thousands of comic books only to turn around and sell them for just a couple hundred dollars. The problem is that the media doesn't really report these things because, well, they're not that interesting. Instead, the media promotes these rags to riches stories of ordinary people finding rare and valuable comic books and selling them for millions of dollars. And this could unintentionally warp someone's perception and make them believe that all comic books have a high value. This is exactly what happened in the comic collector bubble of the 90s. But before we get into it, I'm going to put on my imaginary generalization cap that'll let you guys know that I might skip over some details that you think are important. So if I do, please let me know in the comments and then we can all kind of learn a lot more things that I didn't have time for in this video. Community. It all starts with the creation of the first comic book shops. You see, comic books were originally sold on newsstands, but in the 70s, several stores opened up that would sell back issues of comic books as collectibles. It wasn't long until publishers took their new comic books off the streets and into these specialty comic book shops. But more on this later. Jump to the 90s, where speculators were coming in and seeing how people were buying and selling old issues of comic books for many times their cover price, especially hearing stories of Golden and Silver Age comic books, originally a few cents at the time, now going for six figures. To them, that sounded like an amazing investment opportunity. So they went out and bought multiple copies of individual comic books in hopes to sell them one day and become rich. That on its own might not be that bad, but here's where the problem sets in. People were buying more and more of these books because they saw value in them. And because they were buying more and more, publishers were printing more and more. And then you're selling millions of books to half a million readers and you're oversaturating the market. And that doesn't really work out so well for investments. Strongly generalizing once more here, the value of something is determined by its supply relative to its demand. So let's take a look at these two factors for the comic book world of the 90s. So first off, let's look at demand. Now there's a lot of ways to create demand, but I want to look at another failed collector industry of the 90s, Beanie Babies. One of the key factors in creating demand for Beanie Babies was that they avoided being distributed in mainstream chain retailers in favor of small gift shops. This helped the product seem rare and prompted people to buy them as soon as they could, thus creating a high demand. You can't just buy Quackers the Duck anywhere, so if you find one, you better buy that thing quick. Sound familiar? This is exactly like those comic book shops we were talking about earlier. Publishers were selling their comic books through these small specialty shops because there wasn't really anywhere else to sell them, and this might have made them seem rare to speculators, which only drove up the perceived worth of the comics. But the reality was that they weren't rare at all. This is where supply comes in. There were millions of copies of these 
comic books laying around and speculators hadn't caught on yet. The publisher started putting out these variant covers and shiny foil editions and all sorts of nonsense that would make you believe that your comic book was valuable and it was gonna put your kids through college someday. So here's an example from the collection that my dad gave me. This is Venom Lethal Protector number one from 1993. It's got that nice shiny cover just the way God intended. The cover price for this comic was $2.95, but today you can buy it on eBay for six cents, or you can splurge and get the whole series for just $2, which is still cheaper than this one comic was back when it first came out. The death of Superman in 1992 was a huge contributor to the crash of the comic book industry. People were buying this thing, three, four, five issues, all for themselves, thinking that they're gonna hold on to it, sell it for millions, because they have the last Superman comic ever made. But it didn't really turn out that way. In fact, today you can get four copies of that comic book for around $20 on eBay. Some consider this to be the big tipping point of the comic book crash. Speculators had all these comic books that they thought were valuable, but they couldn't sell them. If everybody already has three copies of The Death of Superman, who's gonna buy your copies? These comic books were everywhere, and because of that, they weren't worth anything. Suddenly, comic books were in high supply but low demand. These speculators who were buying four, five, six copies of comic books suddenly stopped buying them all together. But the publishers were used to printing millions of comic books, so they still printed a lot, but now nobody was buying them, and they're not making enough return on their investment, and the industry was hit very very hard. So why did the birth of Superman go for 3.2 million dollars, but the death of Superman only goes for a few bucks? Well, it's because Action Comics number one is genuinely rare, as are all Golden Age comic books. In the 40s, during World War II, people back home really wanted to help with the war efforts in any way they could, and one of the best ways was by donating all of their scraps, including paper, to the war efforts. Paper drives were held and anything deemed useless scrap paper was sent to help the efforts, including comic books. That's why of the original 200,000 copies of Action Comics number one, less than 50 exist to our knowledge today. Pair that with the fact that it was not only the birth of Superman, but of the superhero genre and you get a comic book that's worth a lot of money. So the idea of collecting comic books nearly killed the medium itself. But why am I even talking about this? Am I trying to tell you to stop collecting comic books? Absolutely not. Chances are, if you're watching this video, you have a genuine interest in comics. The reason that the market crashed was because of these speculators who weren't buying them because they liked comic books, but they were only buying them as investments. And I think that's important. Collecting something not because you wanna make money off it someday or prove that you're a fan to your friends because you have a certain issue or a toy or a holographic whatever, but just because you have a real sincere love for it. So I don't really have a question that I wanna ask you this week. Instead, I just wanna know your thoughts on collecting comic books and the industry crash as a whole. There's so much that I had to skip over for this video, but I wanna know what your opinions are on it, and I'll be right down there in the comments all day today just talking with you guys, so look forward to seeing you down there. And if this is your first time hanging out with us here at NerdSync, we do weekly comic book videos every Wednesday, and I don't want you to miss out on any of it, so please, subscribe. Once again, I'm Scott, and we'll see you next week for more things that you thought you knew about comics. See ya. Doctor Doom was created in 1962 by Stan Lee and Jack Kirby, as were probably all of your favorite classic Marvel characters. But it seems like these two had kind of different opinions about what Doom's face looks like under the mask. I want to believe that they both started out thinking that Doom's face is hopelessly disfigured, as we can see in Fantastic Four number 10 when we get this reaction of Doom removing his mask.